I have always asked myself a lot of questions. Always bored at school, where all questions were answered, except for the important ones. I spent the time daydreaming, thinking about the world. Easter Island, the Pyramids of Giza, Machu Picchu, mythical places which have all made us dream at some point. You might ask yourself questions, lots of questions, but asking the right ones truly is an art, a priceless art that everyone can afford. This is how I found myself many years later looking into the past of our planet, far, very far back in time. And what we discovered changed my vision of the past forever. We did a lot of reading before investigating on site. Many far fetched, contradictory, confusing things which could easily convince those who know nothing about the subject that nothing interesting is to be found in the ruins of our ancient people. Yet the perfection found in these ancient constructions defies modern reason. I decided to surround myself with competent people who could enlighten me and avoid any hasty deductions. As the investigation progressed, uncovering new elements along the way, I saw the look in their eyes change. And so did mine. I had to set aside my prejudices, what the French philosopher Descartes called wiping the slate clean. I had to remember the time when I looked at the world differently, in a more simple way. And this reassured me, inspired me, and gave me hope, as new perspectives are always brighter than what we can imagine. Let us start with one of the most well-known ancient sites on Earth, a minuscule island lost in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Rapa Nui, Easter Island. The little trip, it was Rapa Iti. The big trip, it was Rapa Nui. Easter Island is a speck of Earth in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, located 3,700 kilometers away from the coast of Chile and about 4,000 kilometers away from French Polynesia. In a period of 100 years, the people from Rapa Nui are believed to have sculpted about 1,000 volcanic stone giants, the Moai, made from stone quarried from a crater. Once finished, these statues inserted at the bottom of the volcano were stood up through a great effort by the people. Some of them were erected on pedestals, the au, set at various places on the island. Here are the main ones. 
Tongariki, the largest Moai formation. To Pitakura, the navel of the world, with the largest Moai transported from the quarry. In the Bay of Anakena, where the Moai are capped with their red pukau. Tai, where they have restored the white eyes of the Moai. Vinapu, the most ancient Au of the island, according to archaeological studies. And Akivi, the only formation where the Moai look to the sea, and more specifically to the equinox sun. Let's quickly review the history of the island before getting to the important questions. The extraordinary saga of the Rapa Nui people starts there, in the Anakena Bay, where King Hotumatua, who left Polynesia with his bravest men, first landed. It is believed that they had built a prosperous society, and the most accepted hypothesis is that the Rapa Nui collapsed following clan wars throughout the centuries, while deforestation occurred because of the statues. However, in the latest archaeological discoveries, reality might have been quite different. Epidemics introduced by the Spanish navigators at the end of the 18th century, slave raids at the end of the 19th century, almost exterminated the population. We have to remember that the population here was reduced to 110 or 11 people at one point. The loss of the guardians of the Rapa Nui culture, who became forced laborers in the Peruvian mines, and the Christian evangelization campaigns almost exterminated the culture of these people. The Rapa Nui may have originated from Hiva Oa, about 3,600 kilometers to the northwest. You don't embark on this kind of trip lightly. You must think about food and especially water, because a 30 to 50 day trip by boat implies a certain level of logistics. There must be enough supplies for the trip back in case of failure. When talking about the history of the arrival of the first known king, of the first major lord, maybe, Hotu Matua, we know that two pirogues landed, but we don't know how many had left. It's hard to comprehend what such an expedition could entail. You can eat fish, but enough water needs to be provided for such a long trip. You need to know ahead of time how many days at sea there are before reaching land. Either Hotamatua first sent scouts in various directions, and by chance one of them discovered Easter Island, or they left randomly and out of sheer luck they discovered this speck of land in the Pacific Ocean. Alternatively, they might have known the position of the island beforehand, which raises the question as to how could they have known about it. Linguists cite the resemblance of the Rapa Nui language with the original Polynesian language. The former would have in fact evolved during migrations. This confirms the oral history of the Rapa Nui. They claim to have accomplished this trip straight from Hiva Oa Island. If it's true that they all migrated from this place Hiva, the linguistic evidence suggests that Rapa Nui left that group of people first and came here. Of course, they were all speaking the same language at that time. It's difficult to reconstruct the true story of the Rapa Nui people, as it's been terribly damaged by multiple invasions. Recent archaeological studies go against the accepted idea of a nation of warriors. According to the American anthropologist Carl Lipo, the obsidian blades, long considered weapons, may have actually been tools for sculpting and gardening, noting their lack of a pointed tip. There are also no traces of fortresses on the island. And then there are movies that show very little respect for the people of Rapa Nui. After filming on the island, an American production company just threw a concrete moai that was no longer useful out into the ocean. But let's get technical. The giant moai of the Rano Raraku, which measures 22 meters high and weighs about 250 tons, is often shown. But we seldom see the moai which was sculpted in the crater wall, this complicated their future extraction. You could think they were not sculpted to be extracted. However, since they are not visible at ground level, why go to that much trouble? These moai weigh between 40 and 60 tons and are located about 15 kilometers away from the quarry. Some of the moai were capped with a bukao, hats made of red volcanic tuff extracted here at the site of Punapao. 12 kilometers from the quarry over steep terrain. 
The pakaia were transported, hoisted up and set on top of the moai's heads, sometimes at a height of 8 meters. How? Very simple according to this information panel. Maybe someone has a better explanation, but no one has yet thought it would be useful or important to specify it here. In fact, no one really knows. We may have a vague hypothesis regarding the transportation, and we believe the moai might have been erected to protect the houses they were gazing at, although the statues tend to look more to the skies than to the ground. Experiments have been set up on flat surfaces to simulate the transportation of a five-ton moai. However, it's impossible to confirm that the same process would have been possible with an 80-ton moai like this one. Ahuvinapu is different from other sites because of its massive architecture, and it leads to some unsettling questions. Being the most ancient and still in place, it demonstrates that this way of building was the most resilient, therefore the safest. It was the best advertisement for this technique. True to the idea of linear progress by Homo sapiens, you would expect the subsequent sites to be built in a similar fashion, or even better. And the problem is that actually all the Ahu built after this one were never as large nor as precise in their assemblage, and all ended up collapsing, but not Ahu Vinapu. So the questions are, amongst the builders at Rapa Nui who followed, none of them noticed that the only viable technique was the one utilized at Ahu Vinapu. And if they did, why not reproduce this technique? Therefore, either the secret of this structure is a unique case, lost in history, or the people of Rapa Nui had nothing to do with its construction. There's strong similarities in the style between Ahuvinapu and the structures attributed to the Incas in Peru. Genetic analysis of the island chickens show there was contact between both places, but we don't know in which direction. Destination Peru. More specifically, Cusco, the old Inca capital that, like Rapa Nui, was called the world's belly button. Either both tribes see themselves as the center of the world, or maybe the Earth has numerous belly buttons. If we set a picture of this wall and a picture of an Inca wall, we would say this is an Inca wall. Here, in the Andes, it is everywhere like this. So I would say it is more appropriate on our side to believe that, indeed, they came from the Andes. The problem in Peru is that there's very little information about the time before the arrival of the Catholic Inquisition. It means that you can be confused about the history of the buildings and their techniques. There was an interruption in the process of history. The Catholics at the time were not interested in gaining knowledge with regards to the ancient techniques. They just wanted to prevail. This church was built directly over the Inca temple of Coricancha, covering it entirely. However, the Catholic Church was not alone in the use of this rather high-handed method, as it was practiced everywhere by conquerors and settlers. Like here, this mosque over the Temple of Luxor in Egypt, or again the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek in Lebanon, where Romans preferred to build on top of existing foundations, which is understandable as each block weighs over 1,000 tons. Here, the Church sought to destroy the archives of these people, until everyone accepted the popular image of the barbaric and bloodthirsty Incas engaging in human sacrifice. It's very sad to see how the immense knowledge of these very ancient people were discarded, knowledge that we are just beginning to rediscover, especially in the field of medicine and in politics as well. The priority was to give the opportunity for everybody to fit in. And because they did not succeed at integrating all the people, at one point, they separated. From the time the Christians arrived, the people who did not succeed in fitting in became allies with the Christians. And this is the reason why the empire weakened. And in the end, it's the fall. It was important to avoid any further rebellion. For that, they had a radical option. It was to kill the leaders, the chiefs, the sages, then it would be easier to control the people. You kill the leaders, spreading confusion amongst the people, and the rebellion is stopped. The excuse to execute them, to kill them, was that it serves them right. This method is as old as the world itself. Well, actually, maybe not. Forty-five centuries before the arrival of the Europeans, life was quite different on the Pacific coast of Peru. Civilization has been there for a very long time. The oldest American city to date, Carol Supe, bears witness to this. This vast city was remarkably organized, 
with streets, squares, housing, amphitheatres and temples in the shape of pyramids. It dates back 5,000 years. According to the Egyptologist dating, this gigantic mother city was contemporary to the pyramids of Giza. Archaeological studies show that Karal was destroyed about 3,800 years ago following earthquakes or other climate-related catastrophes. The city is kind of a problem for those who studied it, as no fortresses or weapons were ever found. And so they have to admit the incredible possibility that this city lived in peace for over a thousand years. It seems improbable to modern humans that people could live in peace for vast periods of time. When they discover sites like Corral, the main difficulty for archaeologists is the state it's in, which renders the reconstruction of daily life challenging. We can find small blocks of stone joined together by clay cement, the same technique as we might find at a later stage at Machu Picchu or at Ollantaytambo, which will later evolve towards greater precision. They may have started to build corral with small stones, and it would have been completed with a refined technique, as we can see on the most recent parts of the Machu Picchu site. This would be the normal evolution of the technique throughout time. Discovered in 1911, at a time where in Europe, Incas were still believed to be savages, this city was unknown to the Spanish during the time of their occupation of Peru. It shows impressive technical expertise, especially in the management of water and its distribution system. Its stone assemblages are harmoniously integrated into the environment. However, aside from the incredible feat of bringing the materials to the site, it does not present any particular difficulty. But what surprised us was at the heart of the site. Built in a totally different style, huge andesite blocks of very hard stone had been assembled with precision without any seal. Stone against stone. If this stone comes from a quarry from the other side of the valley, then you really wonder how could they have transported these heavy blocks on such a steep slope? And why such a different style? One must not confuse the function of certain structures and spaces. Like, for example, the temples and palaces, which have always been sophisticated buildings. Almost perfect, well-assembled masonry. In contrast with the more functional structures, like, for example, a house. You might not use the same techniques for buildings intended for rituals as for buildings intended for housing, which I can understand. But then why are some of the walls mixed? This could be due to repairs, but then the question would be why was it not repaired identically? You can clearly see that the big blocks are more ancient compared to the smaller blocks. Why? Quite simply, the small blocks are set on top of the big ones. Similarly to Easter Island, the builders have assembled complex polygonal shapes, which do not seem to present any kind of difficulty. Let's draw some comparisons which make no sense according to archaeology, as the sites we are going to compare are separated by thousands of years and kilometers. Here you can see an assemblage from an angle of a wall in Machu Picchu, and another one from the Temple of the Valley in Giza, Egypt. You might notice the same type of general symmetry in the shape, like here, still at the Temple of the Valley in Egypt, and there, at the heart of Machu Picchu. At Machu Picchu, and in the Temple of the Valley. You could explain these parallels by the fact that confronted with the same problem, human beings will all find the same solution. Simply, you don't randomly assemble blocks, and that when needed, they were cut to create these patterns, which gives us just an idea of the level of mastery required. How's this for logic? You start by assembling extremely resistant constructions with massive stones, and then as time passes, you build less and less resistant structures with the stones the size of bricks. Long live progress. These stones disjointed by one or more earthquakes allow us to understand two things. First of all, the internal wall surfaces fit together precisely. The face of the stone on the left is slightly twisted, and the block on the right exactly mirrors this twist. Do you realize the difficulty of achieving this? This complex work does not seem to be useful in any way. 
If these walls are an evolution of the techniques in Corral a millennium earlier, then where does this style with the enormous stones come from? Where is the logic in all of this? It's even more obvious at Sacsayhuaman, the fortress with its three enclosures overhanging the city of Cusco, the ancient capital of the Incas. Three levels made of blocks weighing a few dozen tons, assembled with very great precision, over more than 400 meters long. The angled stones weigh over 200 tons, and the others up to 60 tons. What is the purpose of this fortress? Military speaking, we find numerous weak points. If this was simply a way to appear strong, they might have gone a bit too far. At the site, the guides are happy to tell us that the whole site represents the head of a puma, and that this fortress represents its teeth, the rest being made of the outer walls of the ancient Cusco. You might be able to see this as an eye. It's a beautiful story, but how confident can we be that it is one? What we notice is that the builders must have been able to transport, hoist, and assemble stones weighing dozens of tons. But when repairing the stones that were damaged or had disappeared, this is what they must have done. At Ollantaytambo, still in Peru, we find the same thing. Walls made of small stones, classically of the Inca era. And these. Here, the first traces of settlements date back to around 600 BCE. If these were the same builders, then they lost their know-how along the way, because for some unknown reason, they were unable to complete them or repair them identically. The style, the quality of the stone, and the difficulty of the work are in no way the same, as the repairs are to be found on the upper layers of the walls. It means the stones underneath are older. The builders, here again, started by assembling gigantic stones with very great precision, and to finish off with smaller ones assembled with less precision. At Ollantaytambo, our eyes were drawn to black stones carved in a certain way. Our guide said that there was a link between this site and the site of Tijuanaco in Bolivia, that similar techniques had been utilized. From what was said, the sites were not dated from the same time. But then again, this was rather unclear. We decided to head off to Tijuanaco, through the Andes, on the other side of the famous Titicaca Lake. Between 800 and 1100, Tiwanaku administered a very large territory. What makes the plateau interesting is the following. A vast enclosure made of walls and pillars, an entryway leading to a door. Except none of this is authentic. It is in fact a reconstruction based on the vision of an archaeologist. Here is the site pictured before its restoration in 1892. At the site, no one tells you anything. There's not even a sign telling you when it was actually restored. You could believe this was an authentic site. But curiously, this creative archaeologist did not find it useful to look at the site of Pumapunku, located about one kilometer from Tiawanaco. Its builders are said to be pre-Inca, therefore before the Incas. And they would have built all this. But what happened here? Why was the site destroyed? A dispute between shamans is mentioned. If this was actually the reason, then it's probably best not to anger a shaman or they'll smash you like a dozen ton block. We asked Eric Gontier, geologist, to come with us as we wanted his advice on the technical process. This you can get with some small shards of rather flat and slightly abrasive rocks. And then it's just a question of time, meaning that you will need to get in and come out, you see? Coming and going like this. But it's an enormous amount of work. Eric told us that in India, stone cutters are still using the same or almost the same methods as the one used thousands of years ago, except the use of hardened steel, too soft, so it was replaced by carborundum or other hard alloy tips. When using hardened steel tools, the stone cutters usually hit at most five or six times before sending them again to the quench. Eric insisted on the fact 
do not underestimate human capabilities. Because as soon as you question the academic version, others will assume that you believe it was built by aliens. That's what he meant by not underestimating human capabilities. No, this was handmade. Some people automatically use the extraterrestrial solution to resolve the issue of the tools. But to tell you the truth, although we cannot explain the methods used, we don't feel that this was something made by ancient aliens. With a copper lamella, then you go over again and again. There are technical gestures. You cross, then start again, and so on. We advised Eric to wait a bit before making a decision. The next day, he will use our roughness measuring device, a tool that measures the surface flatness thanks to a minuscule diamond tip maneuvered by a computerized arm. We will try and find the spot that has been knowingly polished by hand, acknowledging the fact that there are natural little grooves, which are gas bubbles that remain trapped in the endocyte, which is here. The first measurements on randomly selected stones provide interesting results. Then, as we start to choose the stones, the numbers get more accurate. 76, 5, 16. Oh my goodness. We then return to the stone we were looking at this morning. Eric places the roughness measuring device over it. Look, here. Amazing. We're curious to know the result, as the block appears to be particularly smooth. The graph that appears is very flat. 31, 6, 5, 3. Wow. Wow. A variance between the highest and the lowest points on the surface. One micron equals 0.001 millimeter, and you need 1,000 microns to make one millimeter. 30 microns is 0.03 millimeters. This surface is 10 times smoother than modern flat concrete, already spotted by Christopher Dunn, an aviation engineer who based his career on precision. In the hotel room, we cleared off a table that had a glass tabletop. The glass tabletop was within seven thousandths of an inch of being flat. Going out to Puma Punku and taking that instrument is within half a thousandth of an inch. Surfaces deteriorate over time. To give you an idea, here is the roughness of everyday materials. They reached an absolutely exceptional level of polishing. Nowadays, we would only get this with the use of powerful machines, including lasers and rotating mechanical equipment of very, very high precision. Remember, he was talking about copper and abrasion. You can be sure he is carefully choosing his words. Another thing we observe here is the place where these arsenica and black basalt blocks are coming from. Black basalt comes from 300 kilometers away in Tiwanaku. 300 kilometers away, transporting rocks weighing a few tons across the Andes and over such a distance does not seem to surprise him that much. Nothing will ever replace an actual visit. Although, sometimes from a distance, we can discover certain things. You might notice this pattern on a slab. A researcher told us this pattern was also present at another enigmatic site in Peru, over 700 kilometers away as the crow flies, Nazca. On this barren plateau, immense lines and representations of animals have been drawn on the ground by the people of Nazca dating back around 2,300 years. Except for a few stylized representations of animals, you can observe mainly straight lines, some very long. The whole site covers thousands of square kilometers. We often hear about the tracks of Nazca, and some in the past have called these landing strips for extraterrestrials. How could you seriously consider that people capable of flying across the universe might need a landing strip drawn on the ground? This sounds as stupid as the hypothesis stating that the patterns were designed to ask the gods for water, rare in this area. You might have had better things to do rather than wasting your time in a barren area where nothing grows. Here again, we know nothing. Although these figures are gigantic, their creation might have been difficult but far from impossible. What interests us is the why. We are often shown animal drawings, but the lines are far more impressive, and both curiously overlap in some places. 
as if we're looking at two different eras and two different styles. On one hand, we have animal drawings and representations of living beings, though none of them lived in this region. On the other, we find abstract and immense geometrical lines. This is inconsistent with the people supposed to have possessed only primitive technology, similarly to the H-shaped blocks of Pumapunku. From the people of Rapa Nui to the Inca Empire, partly because of the foreign invasions, we do not know for certain the why and how of all these constructions. But we can see they have usually been executed in inaccessible areas, in the desert, on top of hills, or on very steep mountainsides. Each time, there seems to be at least two different eras and two different styles, and the most ancient era appears to have a taste for abstract geometrical patterns. Peru is a vast and magnificent land, like its people. It is said there are over 1,200 sites listed, and you would need a lot of time in order to see them all. Sometimes we just trust our intuition and let ourselves be guided by the people we meet. This is how we discovered the next site. After a drive of about 30 kilometers of dirt track, this site is difficult to access. A low stone wall covers the back wall. Another stone wall outside leads us to believe that we are in some kind of sheepfold. Up until now, nothing abnormal except for the fact, for some unknown reason, the other side wall has been cut. And as we turned around, we discovered that the entry of this cave the stones have been entirely sculpted. Here again, the feeling that you are facing two different eras in the building of the structure is strong. This feeling is confirmed by these outer structures in the same style as the sheepfold. A later imitation? The work is clean and the cutouts are beautiful. But wait until you see the next site, located far, far away from Peru, in India, in the Bihar region. We find seven caves entirely excavated from massive granite blocks, spread across two main sites, four at Barabar, and three at Nagajuni. Amongst them, two remain unfinished. They are considered to be the oldest caves in India, and they may have been built about 2,300 years ago under the reign of King Ashoka, according to the scriptures carved at the entrance of certain caves. There are many other caves in India, but these are unique because of their precision. You can observe a reoccurring theme, that the more ancient the structure, the more modern it looks. They were dug into granite rocks, a material harder than hardened steel. Here, the surfaces appear to be cement, but that's an optical illusion due to the extreme transparency of the granite crystal when polished to the extreme. In reality, they are like this, everywhere. We asked the late Jean-Louis Boistel, an experienced stonecutter who has been working with granite for over 40 years without any modern tools. We didn't even have the time to let him know these images have been taken with a highly sensitive camera that allows us to film in the dark as if in full light. In fact, with a normal camera, this is what we got. Here they are extremely accurate, extremely precise. It means they had powerful lights, because to work in this type of area, you would need more than just torches. Also, with torches, you would suffocate. To get people to work in such an environment, 
they would need to be able to breathe. The dust coming from the stone itself is considerable in an environment like this one, especially when you work with pigs. The granite produces sand, shards. This is a problem of granulometry, but more importantly, it produces a lot of dust, silica, that leads to silicosis. I would have liked to know how they ventilated the worksite to achieve something as perfect as this. Already, the production of dust when we are outside covers us entirely. We inhale it if we don't wear a mask, and we drink a lot. And that's when we're outside. So on the inside, if you add up the smoke from the torches, it becomes quickly unbreathable and unworkable. The tribological report, meaning the methods of abrasion used to produce this rock, is a lot harder to achieve on this granite than on the rocks of Puma Punku. This incredible sensation of vitrification is rather surprising. It's absolutely incredible. It seems to be laser-made. I mean, no, it's not laser-made. This is handmade. But you would need thousands and thousands of hours to obtain a polish like this one. A perfect gloss, obtained by a sanding of the surface, which is very hard to get with a classical sanding with a stone and water that we can get with an abrasive, very, very fine sand. There is a shine equivalent to that obtained with our modern means. Yet these caves are at least 2,300 years old. This dating relies upon the inscriptions carved at the entrance of three of them. However, when looking at these inscriptions in detail, we can see the work is far from being as clean as inside the caves. In the most complex cave, the granite has literally become flaky in some parts, suggesting that these caves may be older than we think. In this massive stone hill, two caves have been carved on one side. The one on the left is fully completed inside, and the first one, according to archaeology. The one on the right displays a curved porch, Buddhist style, corresponding to the era of King Ashoka, but the inside is unfinished. The walls are polished, but the ceiling and the ground are still raw. We don't understand why the completed cave is not the one with the porch, obviously special as it's the only cave to have one, but why was it not completed? When looking at the porch more closely, we can see the work is easy on the eye, so to speak, but as beautiful as it may look, it cannot be compared to the work accomplished inside the walls of the cave. You stand slightly to the side, you can see the holes and the deformations here. There are no sharp edges, it's completely damaged. This is second-class work. Here the relief goes back up, and then it goes down again, downward. There are no finished edges, everything is round inside. So here we are facing a much later work. We cannot associate this work with what has been done previously inside the rooms. This porch is off-center, not vertical. It is nothing compared to the precision and the construction of the caves. According to some archaeologists, this uncompleted cave could explain in detail how the other caves could have been constructed. It's hard when looking at this work to imagine it might look like this. The work is very badly initiated, could not result in anything looking at the state it is in at this stage. Even more impossible, as some cuts on the ceiling go too deep. When you have a perfectly polished plane, as it is the case here, it is out of the question to exceed the surface and to produce dents lower than the surface, in which case they would have to do it all over again. But when resuming the work here, there is a splinter which broke a big splinter that is gone, leaving a hole that is just irredeemable. This cave seems to show a failed attempt, maybe done on a cave that was discovered unfinished. A 
king would not take over a cave already completed, but would more likely finish a cave with some modifications, which would explain the difference in the levels on the ground, and maybe his men did not succeed. Of course, this is pure speculation. The contrast between the polished wall and the rough ceiling seems to confirm the idea of a reuse. We would need to further study this room in order to comprehend fully the chronology in the work and confirm or set aside this hypothesis. We measured the surfaces with the roughness measuring device. The device analyzes the micro flaws, but otherwise, to the touch and the naked eye, it's perfectly flat. There is an average difference of a few microns. These surfaces are almost as smooth as glass. The precision tolerance varies between two to five millimeters. The taking of measurements with a rangefinder is difficult because the walls are slightly tilted. What tools were used to accomplish such an exact work? Some defects in the polishing do confirm that these caves were handmade, which makes the need for accuracy even more pronounced. Handmade could mean the use of power tools guided by hand, instead of chisels and hammers. But why such precision? What's the point? A gap of a few centimeters would be difficult to see with the naked eye, and in full light. We were leaving Barabar with the feeling that these caves had more to offer, However, we needed more precise equipment. From Easter Island to India via Peru, we can see two very different styles. The work that is the most ancient is also the largest and most precise. It is the case on Easter Island, at Ollantaytambo, at Machu Picchu, at Nopa Iglesia, and in Egypt. But why this need for accuracy? We were leaving Egypt with Eric, who was becoming more and more embarrassed by all of our discoveries. Few scientists agree to appear in these type of documentaries, afraid to look like raving lunatics in the eyes of their colleagues. But like us, he wanted to understand. Neither of us had any hypothesis. The granite used to build the boxes comes from one of the quarries in Aswan, about 900 kilometers away from Saqqara, located one kilometer away from the Nile River, from which the 22 boxes had to be transported. Just for making this, it's a number of years, I don't know, maybe four, five, six years at least to achieve this. However, despite it being extraordinary work, surfaces are a little less precise than the ones observed at Barabar. What we can tell from the reflection is that the polish is absolutely amazing. On the other hand, unlike at Barabar, we do not get this perfect flatness of the cave. How did these 22 boxes and their lids get moved into such a small space? And why, yet again, the need for such accuracy for the boxes destined to hold bulls, even if these bulls were sacred? How did they work underground? How did they get enough light to accomplish such polishing? What were their tools? How did they breathe? Have Egyptologists looked into these questions in their publications? If this is the case, we are keen to know the answers, because these are the type of tools shown when talking about the stone cutting techniques of ancient Egypt. When we look into ancient Egypt and we follow their civilization over a 3,000 year period, and we are told that they use very simple tools at the beginning of their civilization, such as copper chisels, um, wooden mallets, stone chisels, stone hammers. And then you follow the progress of that civilization over 3,000 years, and it ends up they're still using the same tools that they started with. That doesn't make sense. Christopher Dunn offers his opinion as an engineer, 
No matter what the techniques are, the thought process stays rigorously the same throughout the ages, especially regarding the complex structures of ancient Egypt. Tools had to evolve. We go from a single stone to a stone attached to a handle, then little by little, the tool is perfected. However, despite the fact that masterpieces were created, for some unknown reason, it might not have happened that way. Particularly when you uh, look at what they created, because the tools that are found in the archaeological record are not capable of uh, creating the artifacts from that period. Convinced for over 20 years that the Egyptians are indeed the creators of these structures, Christopher Dunn has been tracking down their tools, clearly more advanced when looking at their constructions, which he explains in detail in his work. Each stone of the outer wall weighs between 200 and 400 tons. It is completely surreal. So much so that nobody has tried to discover how they could have done this. These stones have been covered by granite paving, from Aswan, as usual. We notice that these massive stones all have different shapes, fitting together accurately. We have never read or heard of any serious explanation regarding the building of this temple, as if piling up stones weighing 200 to 400 tons was just child's play. For some, the builders could have used ramps to raise them. Others mention hoists. Get some information in regards to the difficulty of transporting such heavy loads, and you will understand the enigma is far from being solved. Sites which, according to our history, have nothing in common except for the fact that they've been created by people who were barely clothed. The Valley Temple is located on the Giza Plateau, around 100 meters away from the largest of all pyramids. On the 30th parallel, about 4,500 years ago, the Great Pyramid of Giza would have been built, if we go by the dating of Egyptology. No text mentions its construction, nor the construction of the Median Pyramid, also known as the Khafre Pyramid, nor the small one, also known as the Mykerinos Pyramid. In fact, this is not quite right. Fragments of papyrus dated from the end of the 4th dynasty, discovered in 2013, do mention the transport of limestone blocks from Tora, those used for the cladding of the Great Pyramid, but nothing else, no reference to the more than 2,000 blocks of limestone that came from other quarries. Over 2 million limestone blocks, 230 meters on its side, 140 meters in height. Its construction remains a mystery to this day. The site of Giza is built over a limestone plateau, originally made of flattened hills, as we can see on the Midian Pyramid. For the Great Pyramid, the builders kept part of the hill, some kind of giant pivot about 6 meters high, around which it was built. First, they paved about 60,000 square meters of surface, minus the surface of the pivot, which allowed them to save a lot of blocks for the construction. But these paving blocks, weighing on average one and a half tons, are not all identical and have complex shapes, which makes joining them even more complicated. This is even more complex as the ground has been carved in order to insert these blocks. It is a giant puzzle in 3D. Once this was completed, they built the base of the pyramid, which is almost flat, as noted by the Egyptologist Mark Lehner. He detected a difference of only a few centimeters from one end to the other, which spreads over 230 meters in length. We do wonder about the means to obtain such precision, with the basic tools commonly attributed to the Egyptians, that is, if they were indeed the builders of this site. Then they piled up over 2 million limestone blocks in successive rounds up to the top. There again, we can see the height of the rounds are not all the same, and the blocks all have different shapes, meaning that they did not place the blocks randomly. The work was done with such precision that the edges of the pyramid remain unbroken up to the top. 
Today, the blocks of the cladding made from limestone from Tora are missing. Blocks may have fallen down following a violent earthquake in the 14th century. Cladding we can still see at the top of the Midian Pyramid. Cladding that rendered the Great Pyramid entirely smooth from the outside. It was oriented with stupefying precision to true north, with a variation of only a five hundredth of a degree. Precision that would take us thousands of years to achieve again, even with our modern equipment. The first problem was to establish guidelines on the ground with such precision, and the second to raise the two million block while maintaining this precision. How did they do it? No one knows. The base of the Great Pyramid is not a perfect square, but is slightly octagonal. This indentation is visible in these pictures, as well as on satellite images. For unknown reasons, the small pyramid also has this oddity, but not the median pyramid. On top of managing to raise each round of blocks of various sizes, they also had to deal with this indentation right up to the top, considerably complicating the construction. The Great Pyramid was totally smooth, up to the point that it was made impossible to see the entryway on the north face. How can we confirm this? Because if this was not the case, in the 9th century, the men of the Caliph al-Mamun would not have dug a long tunnel within the Great Pyramid, only a few meters below the actual entryway. This confirms that still at the time, no entryway was visible. Either they were well informed, or they got really lucky, as the tunnel was dug on the correct side of the pyramid and precisely reached the junction of the ascending and descending hallways. We notice in this hallway that all the inside layers of blocks are set up together so accurately, it feels like it could be one stone. According to Professor André Pochon, mathematician, physician and teacher at Cairo High School in the 30s, this indentation would have allowed for what he called the lightning phenomenon, precisely indicating the equinoxes, as seen in this aerial picture by the Royal Air Force. This led him to photograph this phenomenon on the 21st of March 1934, using infrared cameras, the height of technology at the time, in order to show the temperature differences on the south face, here in these three photographs taken 15 seconds apart. Thanks to this indentation, when the sun reaches the ridge at the time of the equinox, it first lights up half of the south face for a few seconds, dividing it into two equal parts. It then goes on to illuminate the whole of it, leading to what Professor Pochon baptized the lightning. For some, Pochon is mistaken, as according to them, the cladding of the Great Pyramid did not have any indentation. To confirm this, they are looking at the few cladding blocks still visible on the north face of the Great Pyramid. But look again, these blocks are not the original ones. You can see them here, photographed by the Morton brothers. Despite some damage, these blocks are in excellent condition when compared to the blocks behind them, which have not been exposed to the air since the 14th century. Here, you can see them a century later, quite eroded. Why would these builders have considerably complicated their work by designing indented sides from blocks of various sizes, and after that, to add cladding blocks to fill this indentation? Should Professor Pochon be right? Imagine the complexity of both the design and the execution here. Let's move to the internal structure, considered by many to be a complicated design in itself. It's made up of two hallways. The descending hallway crosses the foundation to then plummet into the limestone plateau. Oriented at 26 degrees 18 minutes, remember this number, leading to the unfinished underground chamber. The ascending hallway leads to the median chamber and then to the high chamber, crossing the great gallery. It also has a gradient of 26 degrees 18 minutes. This internal structure defies all logic. We are moving from a one meter by one meter hallway to a room 8.5 meters high to over 50 meters in length, whose purpose, if any, remains totally unknown. The median chamber is entirely built of limestone. It has a chevron ceiling and a curiously off-center niche. And finally, the high chamber. This chamber is made exclusively of granite. It's the only place in the pyramid where they are found. Granite from Aswan, located 900 kilometers away from Giza. These slabs weigh between 12 and 70 tons. They were extracted here and may have been transported up the Nile River and raised 40 meters on the Giza Plateau, 
and then another 50 meters in the pyramid to be precisely configured to guarantee this perfect horizontal and vertical line. Just this in itself defies all reason. They needed to build the king's chamber at the same time as constructing the pyramid itself. Why? The sarcophagus, for example, is too big to fit through the tunnel. Therefore, it needed to be placed inside prior to erecting the side walls. But let's talk about Egyptology and what that has to teach us. They would have had to have employed about 15,000 men over a 20-year period to build the Great Pyramid. We know nothing of the tools and we can at best speculate about the methods. We don't know anything about the complex management of the building site. What did they eat? Where did they sleep? How did they heal them if necessary? Since the workers lacked gloves or any kind of footwear. This great endeavor was reportedly undertaken to deliver a cenotaph for King Cheops when he died meaning it was utilized during a ceremony, allowing the soul of the king to rise towards the heavens. Once the ritual was accomplished, the pyramid would be hermetically sealed and the mummy would be transported elsewhere. There is no inscription anywhere, no gigantic statue, no signature. To this day, the only thing left from this megalomaniac king is a seven centimeter statue and the very questionable testimony of Herodotus written more than 2000 years later. For a long time, this was the only basis for the pyramid theory. No matter what, 20 or even 30 years to build the Great Pyramid appears to be totally impossible. For example, here is the entry to the Temple of Karnak. That measures about 110 meters in length, 40 meters in height, and 15 meters in width. It would have taken 17 years to build, 10 years for the foundation, and seven years for the rest of the building. And it would have been erected a lot later than the Great Pyramid. But let's go back to Pumapunku, as I've not told you everything about this site. It was during an interview that one of the members of our team had the idea to measure the H-shaped block. The gap is exactly 22 centimeters. On another block, it is 21.9 centimeters, or one millimeter difference. Scientifically, I would need a number of measurements to be sure we are more or less right. 21.9 centimeters on a third one. Again, one millimeter difference. In the middle of the site are two H-shaped blocks in excellent condition. On the back of the blocks, you can see a pattern in the shape of a cross. We decided to go and measure. So, 30 centimeters. And the other? Exactly one meter. I'm not making any mathematical calculations. I'm just observing the averages of these measurements. They are extremely close, leading us to believe they worked here with some mechanical device. But it seems that, at first glance, we could say it was handmade. But there is such a precision that is literally troublesome. We have 60 centimeters. We also found a one meter block. We are facing an extremely accurate decimal system. This means we are not dealing with randomness. We could even say that the blocks have been prefabricated, meaning that a template was used and all the blocks were built from it. The H shaped blocks are one meter high. The crosses are 30 centimeters in width. This gap here, 22 centimeters. We are in the metric system. Now, the meter, this is extraordinary. Exactly one meter. This can't be coincidental. This is a fact. And although this unit logically cannot exist, because we would need to wait for Napoleon to define the true meter, mathematically and scientifically, here, I just don't know what to say. I told you Eric was a brave man. The meter in a pre-Inca site is not very easy to integrate into the accepted chronology. But why is this so amazing? Because first of all, the meter is based on the measurements of the Earth, so we cannot define it without having measured the Earth itself. And secondly, because the Earth was measured and the meter created in 1795. So unless you strongly believe in coincidences, logically, we shouldn't find it used before this date. And it's even more curious to find it on blocks with such a modern looking design. This must have been popular because it was identically reproduced at an altitude of 4,000 meters in the middle of nowhere, measured in meters. 
we measured three H-shaped blocks, as the others were either too deteriorated or unreachable. They were more readily available in 1892, when they were also measured using the metric system. So here's the problem. Because the meter is connected to the measurement of the Earth, if pre-Inca people built this site, they either did it by chance, they could measure the Earth, or this knowledge was given to them. Whether it was deliberate or not, this meter is found elsewhere. Let's go back to Egypt. This inscription would have been carved at the entrance of the Plato Academy, but it might as well have been carved at the entrance of the Great Pyramid. Egyptians were taking measurements in cubits, and the original dimensions of the Great Pyramid, including its cladding, are 440 cubits at the base and 280 cubits in height. In 1859, the Englishman John Taylor noticed that this dimension here, divided by this one, would give pi. Egyptologists certify that the Egyptians only had a very basic knowledge of mathematics, and they did not know about pi, nor about the golden ratio. The high chamber, however, is built on a double square, which leads us to the golden ratio geometry. Maths isn't everyone's strong point, but stay with us. First of all, let's quickly introduce the golden ratio, for those of you who do not know. The Italian, Leonardo Pisano, publicized in the 13th century the Fibonacci sequence, where each number divided by the previous one results in a number that progressively approaches 1.618. It is a number, and more precisely, a ratio between two numbers that is endless, just like pi, but with amazing mathematical properties. But no need to remember all that. All you need to understand is the logic. Since it's a ratio system, we can use its variations, even its square root, which is equal to 1.272. It's been called the divine proportion because we can observe it, statistically on average, just about everywhere around us. It's in the angles of minerals, in plants through the geometry of their leaves, the distribution of their seeds, amongst animal and man and art, just like da Vinci showed us. Building when using the geometry of the golden ratio means attempting to imitate nature. But put these numbers to one side, we'll come back to them. In order to take measurements, you need a reference, the meter or the yard, for example. In Egypt, they used the cubit, which they say varied in size. But in the Great Pyramid, its value can be obtained with great certainty since the high chamber is made with precisely assembled granite. The value obtained through the measurements of this room varies between 0.5235 and 0.5236, or 52 centimeters, three millimeters, and five or six tenths of a millimeter. It is the royal cubit used in the Great Pyramid. But then, although these builders didn't know about the meter, their cubit, by some miracle, is connected to it. It can be obtained easily through geometry. This dimension is one. No unit, just one. The length of the circle is this dimension times pi. So here we have pi. We divide the circle into six parts. Each part equals 0.5236. And what we have left equals 2.618, which is the golden ratio squared. These three numbers are connected by this circle, which has a diameter of one. We went to talk to a man who's been working with ancient measurements for decades. The famous cubit measuring 52.36. If I multiply it by 6, I find 3.1416. So I have a direct link to calculations, to geometry. The foot is 32.36. So if I divide this by 2, it equals 16.18. I have 1.618 and the golden ratio appears. If I want to measure this circle, I will need a measuring unit. Let's take the yard. So this dimension equals one yard, and this one here, 0.5236 yards. It does not correspond to anything in particular. But if we choose the meter, then this dimension equals 0.5236 meters, which is the value of the royal cubit of the Great Pyramid. This can only be sheer luck, as the meter was adopted in 1795, after the Earth was measured. Now let's take the measurements of the Great Pyramid in meters. 
Thanks to its proportion, if we divide this by that, whichever measuring unit we choose to use, the result will be pi. If we choose the meter, this dimension divided by this one equals pi, but this dimension minus this one equals pi times 100, which only works with the meter. Same dimensions, a division, and a subtraction. In regard to the king's chamber, out of all the choices of shape, they chose by chance a double square, using geometry they were not supposed to know about, the geometry of the golden ratio. To build it out of all possible choices in dimension, the builders chose 10 by 20 cubits. This dimension here is pi times 10 meters. This is only possible in meters. This dimension here, plus two meters 618, equals this dimension plus two meters 618 equals this dimension, plus two meters 618 this dimension. This can only happen because the room measures 10 by 20 cubits. If it had been nine times 18 or 11 times 22, we would have the golden ratio and pi in proportion, but not in meters. All of this makes no sense. The meter was set in 1795. Something's not right. Need a break? In a book on the golden ratio, we learn that in the Middle Ages, the builders of the churches and cathedrals also used the cubit, which belongs to a measuring system called the queen. Everyone knew in the Middle Ages that one foot contained 12 inches, and one inch contained 12 lines. On the back, we have the measure of the span, and then the measure of the palm. And after that, the hand, which will give the quine. This sequence of five units was organized for centuries, all the way up to the Renaissance, in a golden way. Which means, in its proportion with the golden ratio, we see how it's arranged around a pentagon. By studying ancient units of measurement, and especially ancient buildings, I realized that, of course we have variable systems of measurements depending on the regions and the era, but the one we find across various regions is the cubit here, measuring 52.36. Amongst all these different cubits in the Middle Ages, one in particular, the royal cubit, carries the same value as the cubit of the Great Pyramid. But where does this medieval cubit come from? It is the same as the one used in Ile de France, in Picardy, and in the central region. As power expanded, it began to dominate the territory, little by little. And within the French crown, we would have royal master builders traveling everywhere. It means that this cubit was sanctioned by royalty, more than 3,500 years after the building of the Great Pyramid who just by chance ran into the same unit of measurement. If I subtract 32.36 from 52.36 as an observation, I find this span, small, like this, that represents, when I read it today, 20 centimeters. Exactly 20 centimeters, which is surprising since the span was widely established prior to the meter. By the way, how was the meter established? It was in 1795, in relation to the meridional circumference of our planet, the circle that goes around the Earth via the pole. It was decided that this circle would be divided into 40 million parts, or 40 million meters, which then gave us the length of the meter as we know it today. But instead of 40 million, if the circle had been divided into 50 million parts, the meter would have been shortened by about 20 centimeters. But why was it divided into 40 million parts? Why not 36 million? Which would have been logical since we divide a circle into 360 degrees. Turns out this choice of 40 million has surprising consequences. But before we discuss that, let's talk with Frenchman Quentin Leplat, who wanted to statistically verify the presence of the meter. The dimensions of the front door's widths consisted of whole numbers in meters, or doors of one meter in width, on monuments from the 12th century. And with such frequency that I decided it could not be just by chance. Because it can happen. On a very large number of buildings, we may find standard units of measurement. Also in, in castles, like the castle of Chambord, where it is extremely obvious. 
The doors, in fact, to go from one tower to the other are one meter wide or 90 centimeters wide. It is very troubling, since it is very accurate. The difference is 1.00 according to the laser. In a church in Saint-Nectaire in my region, I saw a fresco embedded into a wall, and this little fresco was one meter wide. Below it, the stone also embedded was one cubit wide. Obviously, some will say that these medieval builders were not thinking in meters, but spans, and that we should not read one meter, but five spans. Maybe when we put all these facts back in order, we realize what history is usually asking us to believe. The fact that the builders of the Great Pyramid may have, by chance and without knowing it, discovered a value of a cubit connected with pi, the golden ratio, and later, the meter. That in the Middle Ages, medieval builders accidentally may have implemented the same royal cubit as the builders of the Great Pyramid. Centuries later, by chance, someone decided to divide the circumference of the Earth into 40 million parts, which would have given, still by chance, a meter equal to five spans and a royal cubit equal to pi divided by six. And when we chose the meter, nobody realized that five spans equaled precisely one meter. By chance. I don't know about you, but for us, it's not adding up. Would it not be more rational to say that the person who decided to divide the circumference of the Earth into 40 million parts actually knew what he was doing? And that as surprising as it may sound, it was a discreet and multi-millennial transmission of information. Because what we also see is that the choice to divide the circumference of the Earth into 40 million parts means that the diameter of our planet almost equals the square root of the golden ratio. In any case, based on facts, the royal cubit, pi, the golden ratio and the meter are all connected. You can check this for yourself and believe what you want. But be careful, because what we believe influences what we see. At this site, which is at least 4,500 years old, you can find these alabaster bowls. And this second one, it's a bit different. We are told these bowls were used during sacrifices to collect the blood of the victims. They look more like filling holes rather than evacuation holes, since they are raised. But what for? Don't you think these objects look like they have a more technical function rather than simply a religious or ritualistic one? The schist disc with a diameter of about 60 centimeters was discovered in 1937 in the tomb of Prince Sabu, who lived more than 5,000 years ago. We can tell this object was special to him because he decided to be buried with it. However, 80 years after its discovery, we still have no idea what its use may have been. So it was just put in the category of religious or decorative objects, where we put all the artifacts we don't understand. Looking at the precision of this shape, we feel there's more to it. Its central hub seems like it was intended to rotate, but there is no proof it had a technical function. On the other hand, there is absolutely no doubt about the function of this next object. At least 2,000 years later, it represents the mechanical genius of mankind. In the 50s, a physician rediscovered this misunderstood fragment coming from a shipwreck of a boat that sank about 100 BC. Convinced of its importance, he spent the rest of his life studying it. But he died 20 years before technology could confirm his intuition, when the object was internally scanned in detail. The Antikythera mechanism was discovered in the stock objects coming from the Antikythera shipwreck. This ship was sailing to Rome around 60 BC and wrecked in front of the small island of Antikythera, between Crete and Peloponnese. Derek de Solo Price, specialist in gear mechanisms, arrived in Athens in the 50s 
and went to the archaeology museum to see the Antikythera mechanism. In the 50s and 60s, we could only see its outer parts. It was not before the 70s that Derek Price got the opportunity to work with a nuclear scientist from the Center for Nuclear Studies in Athens, a scientist who proceeded to x-ray the fragments of the Antikythera mechanism. And there, what they found on the main fragment was a massive surprise. 30 gear wheels, and the gears are very visible on the x-ray. This could represent the sky at any given time, or be used to determine a date from the specific rotation of the planets. With just one button, you could reproduce all the movements of the visible planets, the sun and the moon. The device is a miniature and mechanical representation of the cosmos, what we now call the solar system. It's a continuous mechanism, and it carries no less than 300 gears and toothed parts. To design it, the inventors needed to know that the Earth was a sphere, and that the stars rotated around the Sun. Spherical astronomy at the time of Antikythera had been established for a while, since at least Euclid, who set the basis for geometry. Otto Lykos established a basis of spherical astronomy. They knew precisely the cycles of each of the planets, including the issue of the offset between the lunar and solar calendars, identified by the Greek metal. Over the course of 19 years, or 19 solar years, there are very precisely 235 lunar months. A calculation that would have been fine-tuned a century later by Kalip de Sizik. If we take four times the Meton cycle, which is four times 19, which equals 76, and then we remove one day, we then have a concordance of both the lunar cycle and the solar cycle that is much more precise. And it's funny, as all these numbers, the 19, the 235, and the 76, are all noted on the machine, on the inscriptions. On the Swiss Matthias Boutet initiative, the Hublot Society decided to reproduce it. But the first time Matthias heard about it, he thought it was a joke. In 250 BCE, we were capable of doing this, and you had gears like this, like that. And then right away, I said it was not possible. And what's next? There were aliens too, and they came, and they gave knowledge to men, and then they left? I thought it was a huge joke, and then I got angry. So I went there, saying I needed to learn a bit more about it. And then it was obvious. It was possible. It existed. It was there, in front of me. The level of maths required is amazing, as the Antikythera mechanism involves complex movements. The person who designed the machine had a long history of performing calculations. That is a certainty. Because in order to represent all these complex phenomena in such a simple way, but yet very difficult to design and implement, clearly this was not a dry run. The orbit of the Moon around the Earth is not circular, but elliptic which gives it a variable speed from the Earth. This is complicated to reproduce, as the gears generate constant circular movements. The wheels gear up one inside the other. They turn over a satellite, but we also know how to do that. They are planetary gears. But while they turn, they will drift away, so they take more time to get to the other gears. So it slows down. Then, as it moves closer, it goes faster. So they manage to get these gears to breathe while working. They move away, then they move closer. And what does it actually do? It changes the gears' ratio. They created something that is absolutely incredible in its simplicity, and at the same time, it's genius. And our civilization missed it entirely. You have to appreciate the mastery of this engineering. There are gears inside that show extraordinary technique and creativity. The research and development, meaning the design of the object, relies on the knowledge that we have to begin with. Because if we are learning while working on it, it can take forever. It could take an entire lifetime. What they won't dare to say in front of the camera, in fear of upsetting some archaeologists, is the level of mathematics required to design such a mechanism. It's far beyond what is usually attributed to the ancient Greeks. 
Otherwise, they would have needed thousands of prototypes to reach such a precise result. But how to go from a design to a mechanical implementation? This is still a mystery nowadays. Yes, because in practice, it is way more complicated than it looks. Take the main wheel. It has 223 teeth. How do you easily break down a circle into 223 equal parts? The antikythera mechanism is not a unique object. It's unique for us since it's the only one that has reached us today thanks to the shipwreck. But we are certain that there will have been dozens. Now with the knowledge of this device, some Greek scriptures sound different. A book came to us, copied by the scribes, from an astronomer who lived roughly at the same time as the supposed implementation of the Antikythera mechanism, Geminos. When you read this text, you feel like you are reading a description of the Antikythera mechanism. If you needed proof that tools or machines did not survive the test of time, this was only 2,000 years ago. Egypt is 5,000 years ago. Imagine what other technology could be lost. It was saved because it sank. That is the paradox. Had it stayed on land, it would have been melted, recycled to do something else. That was the rule for all metallic objects that were no longer useful. And the device would still work had it not remained underwater. How could a major chapter in the history of human engineering have been lost from our records? That the device was lost is one thing, but that the very idea of its existence was lost. What's even more surprising is that this discovery was almost entirely overlooked by archaeology. If you ask a classical archaeologist what the relationship of the elders was to technology, at best they would possibly mention architecture. We can't miss the Acropolis, obviously. For the elders, theory prevailed and tangible work was for the slaves. That's the typical discourse, which has continued since the Romans. The Antikythera mechanism questions this discourse and forces us to reread and also to rewrite a number of things. A stone's throw from the Acropolis, yet again we find the same type of wall. What a surprise! If the Antikythera mechanism makes us reconsider the evolution of human science and technology, then one site completely disrupts the chronology of the timeline of human history. The site of Gobekli Tepe was discovered in the 90s by shepherds in Turkey. The site of Gobekli Tepe is certainly the most archaic temple that we know of today. Klaus Schmidt, the German archaeologist, came to the site and started excavating in 1995 up until 2014. He brought out of the ground six extraordinary vast enclosures, which are absolutely unique in the world. At the heart of the enclosures, there are central pillars. These are two large anthropomorphous pillars, called twin pillars, surrounded by an outer wall, divided at regular intervals by other smaller pillars. The large pillars are about two and a half meters high and weight about 16 tons. And this is where the problem starts. Humanity at that time did not even know how to create a pottery vase. They were really very archaic, they were the last hunter-gatherers prior even to any sedentary life, and they managed to raise pillars which weigh 16 tons. That requires coordination at all levels of all workers. It also requires a main contractor, specialized workers, and we have to remember that over 12,000 years ago, there were only nomadic hunter-gatherers with no specialty and not even the same language to communicate. According to history, this is before recognized civilization. This doesn't seem to fit the narrative. What is surprising is the refinement of all these engravings carved in the round in relief that we may have found everywhere. A refinement that we never could have imagined existed at that time during Neolithic. This calls into question all of what we thought we knew about Natufian and Neolithic after that. We have been trying for months to interview one of the best researchers in the world in this subject. The author of Fingerprints of the Gods. Graham Hancock arrived just in time. He was going to give us the keys we were missing. Here we have a giant megalithic site, much larger than 
Stonehenge, for example, which is 11 and a half thousand years old, uh, which appears suddenly in a community that are, apparently are entirely hunter-gatherers. Where did they learn the skills to, to do this? Do we don't see them practicing? The oldest material at Gobekli Tepe is the best. Where did, did they wake up one morning with some sort of um, magical inspiration that uh, enabled them to quarry and cut stone to put up the world's first perfectly north-south aligned building, which requires astronomy. What was the true purpose of the site? It is a ritualistic temple. There must have been sacrifices. Surely there were archaic rituals at that time. But I also think it is an astronomical observatory. One of the pillars raises the issue of agriculture. At the top, you can see baskets. Behind, we can see stacks of wheat, things like that, interwoven. It seems certain that this temple was there prior to agriculture. Yet, we already have these first baskets, the first perspective of agriculture, and that is something that chronologically does not fit. In the academic timeline, nomadic people would settle in one place and then they would specialize their skills and be able to build temples. But here, it all happened in reverse. There must have been something, some event that led to a sedentary life and to the development of human intelligence. Agriculture appears suddenly at the same moment that Gobekli Tepe appears. Actually, when I spoke to the late Klaus Schmidt, he felt that Gobekli Tepe had functioned as a center of innovation in that area, uh, that it was a place where people were drawn to and were taught skills. And this raises a question in my mind, who taught them the skills? Because what I think we're looking at at Gobekli Tepe, the sudden emergence of megalithic architecture, the sudden emergence of uh, evolved agricultural knowledge, it looks to me like a transfer of technology. It looks to me like people came to that area who already knew how to make megalithic architecture, who already knew agriculture, and who knew how to mobilize and organize workforces. And they put that infrastructure into place there and they passed on their skills in megalithic construction and in agriculture to the local hunter-gatherers that they had settled amongst. So who were these people? You can see on the pillars patterns similar to others around the world. I don't know how much we should make of these connections, but it's interesting to note. For example, the Gobekli Tepe megaliths are tall pillars, sometimes weighing as much as 20 tons, with a kind of shape of a letter T. And the top of the pillar, the T shape at the top of the pillar, represents a human head. You can say this for sure because many of the pillars have arms carved into the side and the hands meet in front of the belly. The positioning of the hands on the Gobekli Tepe figures is just identical to the positioning of the hands on the Easter Island statues. On this belt is cut the letter, what we, a sign that we would recognize as the letter H. And oddly enough, that exact same H shape, as you know, uh, appears in the H blocks at uh, Tiwanaku. There are certain creatures and animals which are cut on the Gobekli Tepe megaliths, which are reproduced exactly in structures in Peru. And I went into this in some depth in my book, uh, Magicians of the Gods. You can see handbags on one of the pillars. This is also what got Graham Hancock's attention, since there are similar types of handbags in the images of the Mesopotamian god Oanes who is said to have brought civilization to this part of the world. A motif that we can also find in Central America is the Hand of God, who will later be called Quetzalcoatl, also a transmitter of civilization. What we are often seeing in these similarities is what we would expect to see if one culture on one side of the world and another culture on the other side of the world had both received a legacy from the same third-party culture. How else can we explain these parallels? And what about the sudden appearance of this temple and agriculture 12,000 years ago? We have no precedent prior to this site. It feels like they reached perfection all at once. At the beginning, we thought of sedentary life had brought man to spirituality, that is, to build temples, then cities. Here, we realized one thing, and we have to go backwards and think of spirituality leading to sedentary life. So, for archaeologists, this is disturbing. We made a mistake in our thinking. It's interesting that Gobekli Tepe means the hill of the navel, another one. As Klaus Schmidt discovered, this navel has been deliberately buried. This allowed for it to be precisely dated, 11,600 years ago 
with a margin of error of about 150 years. But why go to the effort of building this site for it later to be buried? Did it need to be preserved? We could think of it as a message left for posterity. We've noticed the date 9600 BCE corresponds to the abrupt end of a time called the Younger Dryas. As the Earth was getting warmer and was progressively coming out of the last ice age, the temperature brutally fell by seven degrees. This Younger Dryas episode has for a long time been mysterious to geologists. We know it happened, but they've not known why it happened. About 1,300 years later, the temperature suddenly climbed up again by 10 degrees. There was a second episode of cataclysm, a second episode of global flooding. Uh, geologists call it meltwater pulse 1b. According to several scientific studies, these two events might have been due to the comet impacts hitting the Earth twice, 1,300 years apart, creating cataclysms our ancestors would have witnessed. Every account that I'm aware of that exists of a former human civilization that was brought low by a cataclysm, there are no exceptions. If large debris did hit our planet, you can understand how people might have assumed they were being punished by a divine power. This impact hypothesis is nowadays considered a serious possibility by science. In the layer of the Earth, corresponding to the beginning of the Younger Dryas period, we find massive quantities of platinum associated with nano-diamonds and carbon spherules. Minerals melted at a temperature of 2,000 degrees and vast quantities of ash the result of global fires. This points to the confirmation of the impact hypothesis. We can constrain it to the period between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Again, as stated by Graham Hancock, we do have records. As Plato wrote, Solon was told that Atlantis sank 9,000 years prior to his visit in Egypt, in 600 BCE, or 11,600 years ago, which coincides with the end of the Younger Dryas period. We must not take all legends literally, but we must not dismiss them all either. Let's talk about the legendary city of Kamari Kandam of the Tamal people in southern India. This very evolved civilization may have occupied a vast extension of land with massive libraries and universities. However, 11,600 years ago, the date of the end of the Younger Dryas, Kamari Kandam disappeared totally during a cataclysm. Sea level has risen 120 meters. More than 27 million square kilometers of land, which is roughly Europe and China added together, was above water during the last ice age and is underwater now. I would suggest that the civilization we're dealing with was a maritime seafaring civilization, that it occupied the very best lands that were available in the ice age world. And those very best lands, actually, as is the case today, were the coastal lands, lands close to the sea. Those were the lands that were flooded by rising sea levels at the end of the Ice Age. Local fishermen had been complaining for a long time about underwater structures which their nets were getting caught on, but nobody believed them. They told this to Graham Hancock, who decided to go and dive with them. We went out and dived at Mahabalipuram with the local fishermen in 2002, and lo and behold, everything that they'd said was true. There is an underwater city there. Uh, and what's more, it extends more than five kilometers from the shore. Uh, down, to, down to depths of more than 30 meters. But during the 2004 tsunami, when the ocean withdrew, the bay was exposed for about 30 minutes. And many people saw the ruins. Since then, the site is being studied. But they're not investigating it in a satisfactory manner. They have a, they have, they're still working in the intertidal zone, down to a depth of five meters. They should be out five kilometers from shore at 30 meters, looking at what's lying down there because it has the potential to rewrite history, because we know from sea level studies that that area has been underwater for about 11 and a half thousand years, exactly as is given in the Kumari Kandam story. With time, stories are often embellished, changed, or disappear altogether. Is this the reason why Egyptian priests engrave the history of Egypt onto temple walls? As my friend John Anthony West puts it, the ancient Egyptians are telling us very clearly that their civilization was not a development. It was a legacy. It was a legacy from the first time. And the first time I associate with the arrival of the survivors of a lost civilization in Egypt around 12,800 years ago. And that story, as a matter of fact, is told in full detail in the Edfu building text. 
the priests of that time, around 330 BC, had inherited the archives of the earlier temples. Amongst those archives, written on animal skins and falling into pieces, was the story of the time when the gods came to Egypt, after the destruction of their former homeland, which was an island. They came to Egypt and they brought the gifts of civilization, and the priests decided to copy those crumbling, ruined and ancient texts and make them permanent on the walls of the Edfu temple. This is the story that was told to Solon when he went to Egypt to learn. It was later relayed to Plato. For some, it's only a story, but it's important not to forget how seriously respected Solon was, a member of the Seven Wise Men Council. Because his work contradicts the timeline of history, Nowadays, Plato is accused of inventing the story or being senile. However, a similar story was written on the walls of Edfu Temple. Kamari Kandam, or the Antikythera mechanism, remind us to remain prudent. Only one or two generations are enough to wipe out the memory of a whole population. How many other objects or texts could have been lost in the same way? We knew that 13,000 years ago, our planet was subject to major climate shifts. The ice caps melted in the Northern Territories, a mass extinction occurred. The level of the oceans rose by over 100 meters, and the cold came back and prevailed for 1,300 years. However, we cannot explain the brutal cause of it all. We also know that our ancestors lived through this event. That led to migrations of entire populations, but we thought they were still only hunter-gatherers. Gebekli Tepe reveals this was not the case. From there, it's only a small step to imagine the level of development of civilization is greater than what we thought. We should not expect the remnants of that civilization to be the same as our own. They're going to be very different and may even be unrecognizable. As we have built all over the planet, mined and drilled underground in many places, our civilization has left remnants everywhere. But what if civilization evolved differently? The legends describe all ancient sites having some divine origin. We personally can't imagine they were built literally by the hand of a god, unless that god was small enough to walk through the hallway of the Great Pyramid. Another way to explain how ancient sites share common features is the fact they are simply connected by Homo sapiens, having settled everywhere on the planet and just happened to find the same solutions to the same problems. But how do you explain the fact that humankind started with precisely constructed massive stones to end up with small blocks and cement? But another connection defies this hypothesis, both in time and history. In 1965, the French Francis Mazier talked about a connection between Easter Island, Peru, and Egypt, stating that all three are located, according to him, on some sort of magnetic equator of the Earth. In 1997, an American Jim Allison baptized it the Great Circle, a global circle that was not possible to see until we had mapped the entire Earth. Let's go from Easter Island, taking a 30-degree orientation, and draw a line about 100 kilometers wide. The strip passes through Nazca in Peru, then Machu Picchu, Ollantaytambo, Sacsayhuaman, Cusco, and Nopo Iglesia. It crosses the Atlantic to go over the sacred caves at Tassili en Ager in Algeria then through the oasis of Siwa, by the Giza pyramids in Egypt, over Petra in Jordan, Ur in Iraq, Persepolis in Iran, Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan, Kajuraho in India, Pye in Burma, Sukhothai in Thailand, Angkor Wat and Priyavir in Cambodia, all highly likely to be connected a long time ago, and then over to the little-known islands of Netium in New Caledonia. In the circle, we are not looking at the date of construction, as some are spread out in time over thousands of years, but we are rather looking at their locations, most of them being built and rebuilt over the ruins of ancient temples. Let's first look at the distance ratio between some of these sites. Let's look at the Earth from above. The red circle that surrounds it is our Great Circle. 
The distance between Angkor Wat and Nazca equals the distance between Mohenjo-Daro and Rapa Nui. Angkor Wat to Mohenjo-Daro equals Mohenjo-Daro to Giza and also Nazca to Rapa Nui. At this stage of the investigation, no one is surprised to see the golden ratio showing up again. The distance between Angkor Wat and Giza times the golden ratio equals Giza to Nazca and Giza to Nazca times the golden ratio equals the distance between Nazca and Angkor Wat. Using the metric system in the same way we did with the Great Pyramid, let's measure the distance between Easter Island and Giza. 10,000 times the golden ratio, or a quarter of the way around the Earth times the golden ratio. This is where Jim Allison stops, as like many other researchers, they measure distance in miles and not in meters. Up until 2012, Google Earth gave the figure as 16,179 kilometers between both sites. Today, it's 16,168 kilometers. The reason? The method of calculation has changed. So depending on the method used, the result can change. But seriously, even with the difference of about 20 kilometers, to find an island position on this tilted equator is nothing short of a miracle. Once we check the distance on site with the maps application for smartphones and taking the GPS coordinates of the Great Pyramid in Giza as the starting point, we were able to validate a new discovery by Jim Allison. The point indicating precisely the 16,180 kilometers is located at the center of the triangle created by three remarkable points of this island. The two highest summits, Teravaca and Poike, and the center of the crater at Ranokeo. And this triangle is even more unique. It is the portion of the Golden Pentagon connected to the Golden Ratio. How is this possible? It's quite obvious that the volcanoes are natural. How can you explain the distance between the sites being anything but deliberate? The answer is clear. The builders of Giza had to position the site according to Easter Island, which they must have known about, same as the metric system. A private geologist who is not seeking recognition shared with us his surprising observations. First, he found that Easter Island was located on a hot point of the Earth, Hot points are geological phenomena that stay fixed to a point while the crust is moving. Then he realized that the alignment of the sites on this great circle are located on what we call points of discontinuity of the crust, which means, simply said, it's a point of weakness. In the case of an earthquake, this is where it would break. There are obviously other points of discontinuity on the crust, but the important fact is that each site of this great circle is located precisely over a discontinuity point. This geologist could not explain why they would have built temples at places where they were at most at risk of collapsing, when only a few kilometers away, it would have been much more stable. When the discontinuity point is at sea, then the site must be built as close as possible to land, which is the case for Nazca, where the ocean and the Andes did not leave them much choice for its location. Why are these discontinuity points so important? The placement of sites around the world at specific longitude distances from one another. And those longitude distances are all part of the ancient system of numbers that we find in myths and traditions all around the world. And that system of numbers are generated by the precessional wobble of the Earth's axis. It's a number system based on the number 72. Uh, and there's an astonishing number of ancient monuments around the world that are precisely separated from one another in terms of degrees of longitude by that number system. These sites are located on the Great Circle, but not just any circle. The North Pole of this Great Circle is in Canada and in the northwest of British Columbia. This happens to be the place where the magnetic pole oscillates. The poles shown on a compass are the same ones that enable life on Earth. It also generates a magnetic field that filters solar radiation, enabling life and allowing us to produce electricity. Is this the reason Francis Mazier spoke of a magnetic equator, referring to ancient esoteric tradition? 
Like any group of humans, the world of esotericism is not free from dangerous ideologies. But this isn't a reason to discard all information, especially when it could resonate with modern science. Englishman William Gilbert in 1600 discovered the Earth's magnetic field, and maybe it now allows us to better understand the building of these ancient sites. Ian S. Stewart from the University of Plymouth wondered why the ancient Greeks decided to build temples precisely on spots subject to seismic activity. Journalists jokily wondered whether Greeks worship some sort of earthquake cult. Because of course, everything has to be religious. But for Stewart, reasons could be both spiritual and perhaps medical, since he realized that these sites have pristine water sources. We don't believe any of this has much to do with some ritualistic cult, at least not in the way we think of them. After asking an expert in civil engineering, a polygonal structure stands a better chance against earthquakes than are modern walls made of the same size bricks. So on earthquake-prone sites, the ancients built earthquake-proof structures. Exactly like the Hill of the Nymphs in Athens. And on Easter Island, the site of Tepitakura, this egg-shaped stone is magnetic. A lot of stones are magnetic. You can check with a compass. But how would you know about this without a compass? Is it yet again another coincidence that sacred stone is magnetic and set on a discontinuity point of the Earth's crust and on a hot point? It's the same thing at Giza, where the Great Pyramid is located over a remarkable point of the Earth's crust, where they built the King's Chamber with granite that they had to get from painstakingly far away. Of course, you can keep thinking the only reason for this structure's existence was to be the biggest tomb in the world. You can keep thinking that if you want. But what can we learn from all of this? that these sites are built in the most earthquake-sensitive areas in regard to the geological activity of our planet, that they belong to the Great Circle, our magnetic equator, which might be related to the magnetic activity of our planet, that we carefully place specific stones in particular locations on Earth. The separation in degrees of longitude between Giza and Angkor is 72. Which is yet another way we can talk about the proportions between these sites on the Great Circle, that after discovering the Golden Ratio and the metric system, we can go into degrees. Unless this is yet another fluke, we run into whole numbers when measuring degrees between Giza and Angkor Wat. Nothing in common at first glance, right? But are you sure you saw everything? Take this for example. We're not looking at a random positioning of the blocks. This is clear. In regard to this vertical seal, the one opposite to it almost mirrors it. You have to admit that's rather surprising. The polygonal shape of stones? The shape of the paving stones. A specific system to anchor these stones. Symmetrical similarities. I don't know. 
know the reason, but it is surprising. The stones are not particularly large, and their work closely resembles European cathedrals. If Angkor Wat, Taprom, and Bayon really date back to the Middle Ages, they do seem to be inspired by the same styles found in Egypt, Peru, and Easter Island. The question is more about their location, as these temples were built on the ruins of ancient complexes and spread out almost 250 square kilometers. Uh, even the name Angkor has a meaning in the ancient Egyptian language. Angkor means life to the Horus. Uh, archaeologists say it's all a coincidence, but I wonder uh, if something deeper is going on, some deeper game. They all share this common DNA, this common legacy that goes right back to the beginning. Graham Hancock and John Grisby demonstrated in 1998 that the whole of the site was also positioned according to the stars, on the constellation of the dragon. This is another common factor with all the archaeological sites of our past, to reflect a specific position of the skies at a given time. Gobekli Tepe encodes the winter solstice 12,800 years ago. Giza encodes the equinox 12,800 years ago. The three pyramids on the ground, the Great Sphinx, the constellation of Leo, the constellation of Orion, the Milky Way, they're all part of the picture. Mr. Laveau and Vermaer were also interested in the connection between the site of Giza and the Orion constellation, same as Robert Berval. The Orion constellation is seven stars, four frame stars, and the three stars on the belt. Thus, the three stars we find in the shape of the pyramids. You need to include Sirius, the star dedicated to Isis, Orion to Osiris, and Sirius to Isis. That allows us to make the connection with Egyptian mythology. These stars have particular movements over time. From the Earth, we have a lower point for Orion, meaning that at a certain time, Orion will be at the lowest point in the sky. And 13,000 years later, it will be much higher. Uh, for the next 13,000 years, it will move downwards. And what is really fabulous is that in 10,500 BCE, at the moment where Orion was at its lowest, we had a perfect right angle. For no more than 20 minutes, we would have seen Orion and Sirius, even though Sirius has what we call proper motion, meaning that it shifts away from Orion during the cycle of precession. 10,500 BCE, or 12,500 years ago, a time aligning very closely with the beginning of the Younger Dryas period. Graham Hancock mentioned an astronomical cycle of the Earth called precession of the equinoxes. What is the reason why we often refer to equinoxes and constellations? As explained by Mathieu Laveau regarding Giza, these constellations, once transferred to the ground, would work as timestamps. But what is it, the precession of the equinoxes? From the Earth, stars are not fixed in time. The sky looks like it's moving by a whole degree every 72 years, and you will need almost 26,000 years for a whole cycle. One turn of the celestial wheel. It's called a zodiac. We connect the stars together to create shapes, which then allows us to easily identify these periods in the sky. This is a gigantic astronomical clock that never goes wrong. Plato wrote, the tour of the zodiac lasts precisely 25,920 years. Modern science establishes it at 25,760 years. That Plato managed to get such a close estimate 2,500 years ago, it's an enigma that does not seem to interest anyone. Let's give him credit and use 25,920 years, which represents a big year divided into 12 months, or eras, each lasting about 2,160 years. When talking about the modern era, it's probably in relation to the era of Pisces, which started about 2,000 years ago. Each of the processional eras is carefully represented at the ancient sites. There's no doubt the ancients paid attention to this. During the age of Taurus, the bull was the primary icon in uh, ancient Egypt and in ancient Mesopotamia. As we shift into the age of Aries, suddenly rams become the primary icon. Just look at that column of ram-headed sphinxes at uh, Karnak, for example. As we shift again into the age of Pisces, suddenly it's the fish. No, um, the early Christians used the fish as their symbol. So ancient cultures were aware of this, and, they, and these broad changes in the heavens do seem to be accompanied by broad changes on Earth. According to ancient myths and beliefs of various people, Earth fits into four cycles, the most famous being that of the Mayan suns, or that of the four ages of the Earth, 
and as per the doctrine of Hermeticism, the science of Hermes, which despite bearing the name of a Greek god actually dates back to ancient Egypt. So it's a question of cycles, or periods of time. Throughout history, the end of time has often been mentioned, but more in reference to the end of a time, the end of a processional era. Was this what the French writer André Malraux was referring to when saying the 21st century shall be spiritual or won't be at all? But what is the importance of the procession of the equinoxes? We don't know, but for them, it was important. They were convinced that the planets, the gods often representing these planets, had an influence on the destiny of humankind. The idea of the planet gods is evident in ancient Greece, where the Antikythera mechanism could have a new purpose. But if Aries and Taurus are correctly marking the corresponding astronomical eras, what is to be said about the Sphinx in Giza, connected to the lion? The previous era of the lion started about 13,000 years ago, just before the beginning of the Younger Dryas period. We were wondering about the meaning of all this. Then the results came back from Barabar. We decided to go back, this time with a 3D scanner, a sound level meter for acoustic studies, and a laser level to measure the caves precisely. The images that you are about to see are the result of the 3D scans done by our laser with a rotating beam over all the surfaces. They are the equivalent of an MRI scan. The lasers determine millions of points, allowing us to display the exact shapes recorded with a precision close to the millimeter. We collected tri-dimensional images, which we will show you in the raw format, no touch-ups. Let's start with the two unfinished caves. Then on to the complicated caves. We can see the logical evolution of the shapes. The first one is a trapeze-shaped cave with a curved ceiling, with an entryway at the end. The second one is trapeze-shaped, with a curved ceiling and an entryway at the side. The third one is entirely curved, the entryway at the end and the back wall is also curved. The fourth one is trapeze-shaped with a curved ceiling, entryway at the side, and curved at each of its extremities. The fifth one is more complex. Trapeze-shaped with a curved ceiling, a conical dome cut at one end. This was accomplished in granite at least 2,300 years ago in India. These caves are the oldest of their kind, and for some unknown reason, all those built in the centuries that followed never managed to get the same level of precision and finish. Using a material harder than reinforced steel, complex shapes were built with a degree of precision ranging from 2 to 8 millimeters over a length exceeding 13 meters. This is more than good enough for the eye kind of work. These caves are almost vertically symmetrical, a real accomplishment considering the tools at the time. 
Let's put to one side the questions about the tools that constructed the caves, and let's discuss about the geometry of the shapes. Vapiaka, Karen Chopa, Gopika, and the Sudama room all contain trapezoidal sections. The vertical walls are in fact tilted with a constant angle of less than three degrees. In the rooms with trapezoidal sections, the ceilings are shaped into roughly half cylinders, whose central axis height varies from one cave to the other. In Vapiaka, the axis is located approximately 13 centimeters above the floor. In Karanjopa, it's approximately 1 meter 20 above the floor. In Sudama, the axis is located approximately 1 meter 13 above the floor. But in Gopika, it is more complicated, since the axis is located approximately 47 centimeters under the floor. Building an arc whose axis is located under the floor greatly complicates the taking of measurements during its construction, a requirement to verify correct curvature, meaning you wouldn't choose to make a ceiling like this unless someone specifically asked you to. And everything has been made with a glass finish. The builders wouldn't aim for such precision without a reason. It must have been a necessary part of the architectural specifications. Studying them, we can deduce the incredible skills needed for their construction, which would have required at least one engineer and several highly skilled laborers. With respect to the Ashoka builders, the finished results here appear to be too advanced when compared to the knowledge and the technical means available during the period. Okay, but why construct such peculiar rooms? Something surprising about the caves is the sound and the way it reverberates due to the slight inclination of the walls. It leads to a suppression of echo in favor of acoustic resonance. This can't be a coincidence. But if so, where did they learn to do it? Where is the evidence of the process? Once again, like with the Antikythera mechanism, it's necessary to experiment, to conceive prototypes. Caves of such precision are not created without first becoming an expert. Yet no prototype is found anywhere other than these two incomplete caves. And the work performed in the following centuries in India would never equal or even come close to the level of work here. These spaces behave like resonance chambers. Tests conducted in the Sudama cave show that when you stand in the center of the dome, certain frequencies make precise body parts vibrate. Data analysis using a sonometer gives incredible results for three of the caves. Measurements in the last two are not sufficient at the moment and will need further completion. Let us start with Karen Chopa. The cave resonates at a frequency of 200 Hz, as well as at multiples of this frequency, 400 Hz, 800 Hz, 1000 Hz, and 1200 Hz. Gobika resonates at 200 Hz, 400 Hz, 800 Hz, and 1200 Hz. And Vadatika resonates at 200 and 1000 Hz. Do you realize what this means? Those who conceived and built these caves made them with specific shapes and dimensions to resonate at different frequencies. Can we call this a coincidence? Precise sound calculations 2,300 years ago. How did they calculate those dimensions? At this point, we have no idea, but we will continue to investigate. In regards to Sudama, the circular diameter on the ground of the chamber measures six meters to the millimeter. On this complex shape of a dome, they placed half a sphere about three meters in radius, with a five centimeter difference this time. The center is at one meter above the ground, give or take one centimeter. The length of the room is six meters, as is the diameter of the ceiling. We can't say for sure, but it's starting to look like they use the meter. Six meters in diameter means 18.8496 meters in perimeter. Divided by six, the arc equals pi in meters. What if I told you these granite caves are also located over a discontinuity point of the Earth's crust? It's up to each of you to conclude what you want when looking at these masterpieces. With the help of chisels and goodwill, builders might have accomplished this random miracle. Or maybe we're looking at an example of a science totally unknown to us. We believe historians are mistaken about the true function of these ancient sites. If you spent so much energy maneuvering such massive stones and fitting them so precisely, if you position them at intersections on the magnetic equator, on discontinuity points, if you build them with such specific rocks, utilizing such special numbers, 
If you meticulously align these structures with the stars, then there's obviously more to it. We still have a lot to learn from Barabar and Giza. Before placing the last unnecessary piece of this puzzle, we will recap what we found. Enigmatic sites built with similar techniques everywhere on the planet, implying a transmission of knowledge. Absence of archives or explanations about the means and techniques utilized, a particular care in the choice of rocks. Unfinished elements. An advanced design accompanied by precise construction, contradicting the knowledge and means supposedly used at the time. Astronomical orientation of major sites in reference to the cycle of precession of the equinoxes. An archaeological site pushing back the timeline of human civilization. An archaeological site implying the use of sound frequencies for reasons still unknown. Presence of the golden ratio in geometry when it was not supposed to have been known. A connection between the cubit of the Great Pyramid, the Royal Queen and the Meter, implying they knew the dimensions of the Earth before its measurement in 1795. The positioning of ancient sites within the Great Circle connected to the golden ratio, the degrees and the metric system. The location of sites at the intersection of points of discontinuity of the Earth's crust and the magnetic equator. Scriptures, myths, sacred texts, recording one or more advanced civilizations vanishing in a cataclysm. Looking at all these facts we've presented, instead of chance, we choose a more rational explanation. The existence of an advanced civilization in the forgotten past, who would have disappeared following the cataclysms of the Younger Dryas. We have wondered how the survivors might have attempted to pass on their knowledge, not knowing whether it could be understood by other civilizations after it. When looking at this beautiful work, the thought suddenly struck us. It's either evidence of genius builders, or this is all in our imagination. In the Apocalypse according to St. John, the prophetic text ending the New Testament, he mentions the end of a particular era. You can read this rather enigmatic sentence. The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. On the card of the Marseille Tarot, the Arcane 21, called The World, you can find three animals, as well as the man represented by an angel. We are told about the astronomical constellations, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, that used to be an eagle, and Aquarius, formerly an angel, Aldebaran, Regulus, Antares, and Formulo. Printed on a double square on the tarot card, a double square opening to the golden ratio geometry. Contrary to popular belief, apocalypse in Greek does not mean the end of the world, but disclosure of knowledge. A religious scripture, a card game, structures, multiple communication mediums, conveying the same invisible knowledge to those who don't know how to read it, but will keep playing it and telling stories as humans have always done. In the animal kingdom, playing is the most natural way for babies to learn. This is something we have in common, but humans have one step better, storytelling, the process in which we encode information for the next generation to learn. Playing games and telling stories could have been the best way to discreetly transfer knowledge throughout the ages, because humans have the disturbing habit to always rewrite the past. But they will always let people play and tell tales. Even through the church, with its tetramorph supposedly representing the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were used without realizing this. Otherwise, why would they invert the lion and the Taurus? It may have been before our eyes everywhere all this time. Different ways to encode information for thousands of years, almost impossible to understand before reaching a certain level of enlightenment. It's an extraordinary act of genius created by these builders. And what an amazing lesson of humility and self-sacrifice from our ancestors, who discreetly transmitted this information throughout all time 
hoping one day we might be able to fully understand it again. Given what we can see when we look at these complex structures, it appears that we are still very far away from reaching their level of knowledge. This makes it impossible to understand for those who look without seeing. With the caves at Barabar, Bar, the science of frequencies comes into play the moment you step inside. The King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid at Giza, also made of granite, is possibly a concentration of all our ancestors' knowledge. The chamber, protected by such an inefficient security system that, considering their high level of technical mastery, we can only interpret as symbolic. A system that would lead you to expect a precious treasure, but there's nothing more than an empty granite box, too big to pass through the door and the hallways. Why? The ritualistic or religious explanation that prevents further investigation, after all that we've seen, its significance is self-evident. This chamber contains the ultimate treasure, the treasure of knowledge. It's a sublime mathematical symphony, a true music of the spheres, written in the universal language of numbers. Considering we only spent a short time in the chamber, we recognize sound seems to play an important role. The spectral audio analysis performed by using voice recording data show us the use of set frequencies, similar to that found in the first three caves of Barabar. Is it possible this structure is tuned to use an ancient musical range based on 432 hertz? But all this requires further analysis with more sophisticated material. If what we suspect is proven, the repercussions are mind-blowing. The technical accomplishments all around our planet, in specific locations that can only be found with the help of scientific knowledge, all these clues left everywhere around us. In our opinion, they carry the fingerprints of these builders. These builders who seem to be lost in the memory of mankind, but we've inherited clues left in stone. These clues we also find in scriptures. To the readers of the Quran, we wish to dedicate this sentence. They were more numerous than them and mightier in strength and in the traces in the land, yet all they used to earn availed them not. And to those reading the Bible, this one. I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. For the site at Gobekli Tepe, it doesn't cry out, it screams. And it's not the only one. If we exclude from the investigation the problematic elements, then you'll not find what you're looking for. It's the same thing when an archaeologist who does not believe in the existence of sophisticated mechanical tools of the past does not see the point in measuring a surface with a roughness measuring device or to scan it in 3D. If they are already convinced that it is a byproduct of basic tools, then why bother checking? This goes against the true scientific approach, which, since Descartes, needs to wipe the slate clean of assumptions and prejudices. At the end of the 18th century, a scientist as brilliant as Lavoisier was smiling at the fact that stones might be able to fall from the sky a few decades before the existence of meteorites were proven. So we should be careful, because the science today will probably seem medieval in 500 years' time. It is obvious. We have the best knowledge in the world. They were already saying that at the time. Who can tell if we are right or wrong? No, simply, our knowledge is expanding and our technology progresses based on our know-how and our logic. Our brains continue to evolve with all of it. In 20 years' time, what we say today might be totally outdated. And thanks to all this, science is progressing. Now, vanished civilizations, do you believe in them or not? It does not really matter. In any case, the facts remain. So, today, maybe it is a heresy to look for information where science does not dare to venture or simply does not want to. This is where the problem lies. The hypothesis of a lost civilization is provocative. Most of the time it's ridiculed, and those who defend the theory, as serious as they might be, are ignored, which prevents them from discussing their arguments. As intelligent as you might be, no one is exempt from their own emotions. Otherwise, how would you explain why this subject bothers you so much? 
For this reason, we wanted to pay respect to all these researchers who are fighting silently, away from the media's chaos and the mockeries of their colleagues. Because in the end, only the facts count. What we're trying to say is that we will most likely need to change our way of thinking if we want to understand the science of the builders of the ancient world. I know it's not easy to reconsider the founding principles of our society, on which we have built our current vision of the world. Yet all these kings, emperors, dictators, political leaders, and religious heads throughout our history have each time arranged the stories, erased the record of the losers, and surely wiped out and rewrote our history. But the structures from the past are speaking to us if we try to listen to them. The city of Corral shows us it's possible to live a long period of time without any conflict. In ancient Egypt also, since it didn't start any wars. The Inca Empire again, who showed us that if you don't unify the people, sooner or later, conflict will ensue. Our Earth is perhaps speaking to us. Our magnetic pole has sped up in the past 30 years and you would need to be blind not to see that our climate is disrupted. The ground is rumbling more often and louder than ever. We still have so much to discover. It's now up to you to go and see these sights. Wake up.